are. Hallelujah. Anybody come broken this morning? Is anybody empty? Feeling like I'm so empty. I need to fill up this morning. Anybody that is desperate this morning? Anybody wounded? I need healing. You just have to lift your hands this morning and say, God, just as I am, I come. Just here I am this morning. Hallelujah. Do whatever you please in me, God. Glory to God. He just needs a willing heart. Hallelujah. I can't tell him for you. You have to tell him for yourself. And I'm just going to invite everybody to stand this morning as we bring ourselves before the King of Kings, just as we are this morning. Oh, I come broken. I
and your mercy. Which are new unto us. Morning by morning, God. New mercies we see. And all that we need, your hands, God, continue to provide. So we lift up our voice this morning and say, Great is your faithfulness unto us. And for that, we are thankful. Mm. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me. Glory to God. My soul this morning cries out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to his name.
you have any conviction this morning, none at all whatsoever. It says, I will give you, God, all of my worship. Are you truly giving him all of your worship? Are you truly giving him all of your praise? Or are you holding back? Are you unreserved for what? What are you holding back for? What are you holding back? The praise that does not belong to you. Why are you holding unto it this morning? It's not yours. The breath. He gave you the breath. You are breathing right now. Belong to him. Come on. It says, I will give you all my worship. Don't even think about what he has done. Don't even think about who he is. And you will begin to worship him. You will begin to praise him. You will begin to let go of yourself. The Lord of Lords, the one who has brought you out of COVID, hallelujah, 17 months, you are standing in his house, in his presence, clothed in your right mind this morning, glory to God, you are not on a ventilator, you are not in the hospital, you are not six feet under, give him all your worship, give him all your praise, you alone I love to worship, you alone.
house of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Have the devil, the enemy, make you think all kind of foolishness. Yes. Hey, think you are defeated. Glory yes. to God. And that's how it's supposed to be. No. We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. We serve a chair breaking God. Oh, sorry. 
Jesus. Come on, shout like the people of victory. Hallelujah. Come on, shout like the people of victory. Come on, shout like the people of victory. Hallelujah. Come on, break the silence in the heavens with your glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let your hallelujah shatter some kingdoms. Hallelujah. I stand here to tell hell they could not finish the job. Hallelujah. What the devil meant for evil, God turned it around for good. Hallelujah. Satan has tried his worst. And we still got Jesus. We still got the word of God. We still got the Holy Ghost and fire. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. When you come in the house, you must open up your mouth and make noise to the hell know that the church of God is in session. Bring confusion to them. Expect you to be depressed and cast down. Just break forth with a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glorify the name of Jesus. You know, when I came out of the hospital the Saturday and the Sunday when I was coming to church and I was inquiring of the Lord how the service was going to be. Because I've been out of it a uh, couple Sundays. And strangely enough, the thought came to me, you didn't read your Bible this morning. And I said, but I don't read my Bible Sunday mornings when I'm on my way to church. And it so be that I had my little phone in my hand. And I said to myself, well, I have an app on there. Let me just open up and read for the sake of satisfying this pressure that I'm feeling. And when I opened up the Bible app, it went to Psalms 37. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good and so shalt thou dwell in the land and thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment and the new day. And then he said, rest in the Lord. Hallelujah. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his ways because a man who bringeth wicked devices to pass and then the Lord said cease from anger forsake wrath fret not thyself in any wise to do evil meaning don't bother yourself we're trying to get back no tit for death don't go and visit any spiritualist don't go and pass any witchcraft hallelujah fret not thyself hallelujah the evildoers, uh, they shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, uh, they shall inherit the earth. So I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I want to let every witch and warlock and sorcerer and necromancer know that God is on your tail. Hallelujah. And he will not allow this to pass. Hallelujah. I was laying there in the hospital and the Lord began to speak to me. And I heard the words, mercy has packed its bag and gone on vacation. Be careful what you wish for. Every high thing. 
good to see you. It's good to be back in the house of God. God bless you. Keep praying. Keep on the firing line. Hallelujah. Before I go, let me warn the church. If you weren't fasting, you wouldn't need to hear this warning again. But see, mostly you don't. Hmm. There was two things the Lord spoke about. Several things. But there is a spirit of confusion that has been released in this ministry. And then be careful of who you associate yourself with. Because if you come in agreement and join your hand up with any evildoer, anybody that starts to talk bad about leadership or the servants of God, the same blow they're going to get is the same blow you're going to get. So be careful of who you associate yourself with. God bless you. Hallelujah. Come on. Bless the Lord, somebody. Just wait a minute. Just hold on a moment. He's out to get a black eye. Amen. <laughs> Glory. We thank God and we celebrate our pastor. We continue to undergird and lift him up in prayer. Amen. And his family and a hold. Amen. And we thank God. Amen. That we have a pastor like our pastor. I don't care what nobody say. I don't care what nobody thinks. I don't care what nobody knows. I have a pastor that I appreciate and I love. To let the world hear, yeah. I am under a pastor who is anointed, called, and chosen by God. A leader of leaders. I said, a leader of leaders. An example. So shut your mouth, hell. Shut your mouth, hell. Jesus is against you. Your very thoughts. Your very thoughts are words. And you think because we can't read your mind, but the Holy Spirit read it and know. So don't think we are slumbering or we are sleeping. We are well aware. Your very attitude, yes. mm. your very body language, yes. speak for you. Amen. Yes. Amen. So don't think we're ignorant Amen. or we're blind. Amen. We're just diplomatic. Yes. Oh yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Praise but the day of Pentecost yes. is just around the corner, coming back again. Aren't you reading the signs of the time? Yes. New thing, a new thing. Come on, Holy Ghost, bless you, bless yeah. the Lord, bless you. Come on, come with me. Hallelujah, as we receive the man of God, yes. no other than Bishop Dean Brown. Put your hands together.
Jesus. You know, sometimes you come to church and you 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 come and it's praise and uh, you know easy. You walk in and the the spirit is light, uh, the glow is fresh, yes. and there's you know there's no need for any exertion. You walk with a you know a leap in your step, mm -hmm. but 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 then there are other days. When the enemy meets you at your car, Amen. and you think you're coming to church alone, and he's sitting in the seat behind you, Amen. poking and prodding and, and trying to provoke and get you to enter this place without a peace. And then you come inside here in this holy place. And you expect that the enemy is not in here with you. You expect that he can't come through those doors or those who he works with won't enter this building. And you think that, well, you know, I can bring anything. I can come anyway. I can step into the presence anyway, talk anyway, sing anyway. Not knowing that your adversary wants to take your very life and soul. Come on. He's not playing. <laughs> you realize that? He is not playing. And we should not be playing either. We need to take this fight very seriously. Very seriously. ahead and be seated for, for a couple minutes here. I, I, I think I hinted at this last time, but, you know, I'm just feeling that impression again, you know? Maybe speaking to the same person, but listen, God is after you. He he wants you to live, but the, the enemy is after you too. He wants you to die. Amen. And not just die the earthly death. He wants you to die eternally. He's after your soul. I told you, he's not playing. The enemy is just looking for that one little opportunity, that one opening, that one moment where he can take the action that will lead to your eternal separation from God. You think you have eternity to get it straight when in reality, you only have a moment. Our life is just a whisper. Here today, gone tomorrow. You know, when I was growing up, there was a, a, a very famous guy who we used to see all the time on TV. You may have heard of him. I always, every once in a while, talk to my kids about this famous guy and the moves that he did and his dancing. And he was known all around the world. And he had jackets. And he had music. And he had videos. And he had the move, the glove, the hand. He had everything. Yes. He had his own little uh, place, his land. Never, never land. It was his. You remember him? Yes. You remember him? Yes. And I remember as a young man, you know, young people, we think everything lasts forever. Yes. Right? It never comes to an end. But I remember the day when I heard it. Yeah, it came He was gone. Amen. The guy who had everything, yeah. who went everywhere, who was known everywhere, yeah. broke records everywhere, did everything that could possibly be done, had everything that he could possibly need. But the moment in time came when his soul was required and he had to walk through that valley of death, that moment where life here came to an end. And all that was left for him would be that moment of judgment. The moment when he would stand before the Lord God. And he would have to give an account for everything that he was given. Every moment. Every second. Every privilege. Every word he heard. Every sermon that was spoken to him. Every 
every word that he read in the Bible, Amen. those who he walked with, those who he rejected, yes. everything would yes. have to be Amen. given account of to the yes. Lord. Amen. 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 Come on, sir. And when that moment comes, mm. when he, like Prince, like Whitney Houston, like Muhammad Ali, like all of the greats, maybe Malcolm X, like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, you line them all up. When they all stand before the Lord, they will have to give an account. Yes. And there is only one way you get through. Amen. One mark, one stamp. It won't matter how much you've done. It won't matter if you walk with Mother Teresa every step of the way. It won't matter if you gave all that you had. It won't matter if you did all that you could do. If you don't have the blood of Jesus applied to your life, separation forever. Eternal separation. For there is only one way that we can be saved. One way, and that was by the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. One way. <laughs> Why one way? Blame it on Adam. Blame it on Eve. Our parents, everyone who is in this world, it doesn't matter what culture you come from. It doesn't matter what place you come from. You are all descendants of those two people. And because Adam sinned, because Adam broke the covenant, the promise, the, the, the command that God had given to him, because Adam broke it, then that means he is separated. And everything that comes through him, through Adam and Eve, we are all separated from God. Separate. Doesn't matter how you choose to live. It doesn't matter if you try to keep every commandment that's in the book, every commandment that's written in Exodus, even if you do your best attempt, even if you, you put all of your complete entity and person into trying to live right, you can't do it. You can't do it separate from God. The law tells us that there is no way that we can be saved by trying to be righteous. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. No value in it. There is only one way, one door, one opening. Jesus. That's the only way. That's the only way. That's the only way. I'm telling you again. I'm, I'm re repeating it over and over and over again. You try to run and find a solution somewhere else, but there is no other solution. No other way to turn. No other opening. It doesn't matter if you have a house. It doesn't matter if you have a car. It doesn't matter if you have ten houses, ten cars. It's all being left behind. The only way through is through Christ. So I'm, I'm, I'm repeating it again. So you will hear it again. Your only solution is Christ. Your only solution it is the only way. No other way. No other way. So, please remember my words. That's for someone out there. It may not be for you, but there's someone who needed to receive that this morning. Thank you, church, for letting me come into your presence this morning and be able to share. I, I want to thank Pastor Oral and Lady Faith for the opportunity to be here today. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big thing for a pastor to open up his podium and allow someone to come up here and share the word. And Amen. I recognize the privilege that you've provided to me. And I do want to thank you. I also want to extend a thank you to uh, Pastor Richard's dad. 
Amen. Thank you for all that you've done for me, not only your daughter, which I am grateful for, but uh, your encouragement, uh, your words of challenge and speaking to me and encouraging me. And I, I thank you for that. For those of the House of Liberty Hall, I, I thank you for opening your doors to my, myself and my wife and welcoming us here. Uh, Pastor Fleming, Sister Fleming, especially Pastor Fleming, you've been uh, such a, a, a word of encouragement uh, to me. Uh, the way that you speak, uh, it is encouraging to a little guy like me. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Brother Morgan, you're not here today, but I thank you for your friendship. I thank you for... Uh, the times or the moments that we have been able to uh, share together. Not a lot, but in the ones that we have, I thank you for that. And the rest of the fellowship, the rest of the community, I thank each and every one of you for your heart and your openness uh, to welcome others into your community. Amen. We can't find a place or a, a, a place to rest out there anywhere. Thank the Lord that Liberty Hall is Amen. open. Amen. Welcome. So I only have a few moments and I, I got a, a few things to say in here. So Please uh, bear with me, uh, pray with me as I go through this. This has been sitting on me this week, and uh, I really want to do right by it. So, Lord, I, I thank you for allowing us to come into your house today. I thank you, Father, for everything you've done so far, the work of your hand, your presence, your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that as we continue to open up the word this morning, that your Holy Spirit will permeate through it, Lord God. That you will not only open our ears, but open our hearts to receive your word, to receive your challenge, Lord God. And I pray that it will be transformational, that it will be healing, that it will be uh, freshness to our bones, freshness to our spirits, Lord God. And it will allow us to uh, leave here recharged and ready to face the rest of this week, yes, Lord God. Yes, Lord. We thank you once Jesus. again for your mercy and your grace. In yes, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 So today I want to talk with you about knowing God through his word. Amen. So I want to start off by asking you a question. Have you ever thought about the characteristics of God? Amen. I mean, what does he look like? Where does he live? Uh, what does God sound like? Or, you know, does he look like me? Or what does he do all day long if he's God? Good question. Or, you know what? Why is he even interested in us? Amen. Or better yet, why is he interested in me? Amen. I want to take some time today and examine what we can know about God Amen. and know about him and his relation Amen. to us. Amen. So, God, like each person here, like each human being, God has very unique characteristics. Yes. If you take a look in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, the verse says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Amen. His eyes. That means God sees. Yeah, of course. And it implies that he has eyes yeah. or the ability yeah. to see. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come now, let us Lisa. reason together, says the, the Lord. Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Amen. God speaks. Yes, amen. Which implies that he has a mouth or the ability to amen. speak. Amen. Continuing. Joel chapter 2, 
verses uh, 32. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Or Romans 10 verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if we can call and he responds, that must mean he listens, yeah. he hears, which yeah. implies he has ears yeah. or the ability to hear or listen. Exodus chapter 20 verses 5 to 6, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Jealous God? That means he can feel jealousy. That means he can feel God feels. Which implies that he has emotions, experiences emotions. God loves. Yes, amen. Now, I'm going to come back to this one a little bit later, the fact that God loves. But the fact that he loves implies that he has a heart or has the experience to, uh, has the ability to experience love, love. on a great level. Yeah. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. He says seek first. Yeah. That means God commands. Yeah. He gives directions. He gives yeah. instructions. Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah 41 verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He's going to uphold me. He's going to strengthen me. He's going to help me. He's going to stay. God Defends. Come on. Amen. He's Glory a defender. Yes. Psalms 31, 34 story, verse 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Psalms 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Yes. Psalms 50, verse 50. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. That means our God delivers. Yes. James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Each of these are a call. God calls. Yes. Yes. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your, your thoughts. thoughts. Have you that verse before? Yes. My thoughts are not your, your thoughts. thoughts. Are Neither thoughts. are your ways I my ways, ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That means God thinks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> He has intention. Yes. He acts with purpose. Yes. He counsels. Yes. God is faithful. Right. God is true. Yes. God is near. God. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> you have heard it. God is God. Yes. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no, no, no. no other. Isaiah 46, verse 9. They lavish gold. Let me just make sure I've got this right here. They lavish gold out of the bag. And no, that is not it. Okay, we'll skip that one. But it says the same thing. It vanishes again that he is God. Yeah. And then I move to Exodus chapter 3, verses 14. And this is a big one. Moses, casually taking care of sheep, sees a strange light in the distance. As he moves closer, he sees a bush that doesn't seem to be burning. Strange phenomenon. As he moves closer, he hears a voice coming out of the bush of the fire saying, Take off the shoes that are on your feet because the place that you're stepping into is holy ground. And as he steps into holy ground and he meets God, 
And God gives him instructions. You're going to go to Israel and you're going to free my people. You're going to admonish uh, Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses asks an interesting question. Yes. He asks, He's in name. how are they going to know that you really sent me? And how are they going to believe what I'm going to say to them? I mean, what what authority or what what what's the what authentication message am I going to be able to give to them so that they are going to know that I have truly been sent? And what did God say? He passed his visa card, passed the green card. No! God declares, you tell them that I am, that I am, I sent you. I am sent you. What a word. I am that I am. And that's because God is who he is. Yeah, he, is right he is the one and only entity that could use that phrase and use it with any sense of authority. Yeah. He is who he says he, he is. is. Yeah, yeah. And because he says who he is, because he is who he says he, he is, is. Yeah. that means that every word, every promise, every instruction, every command that he gave to Moses could be, would be fulfilled completely in its entirety and nothing. Uh -huh. No one could stop it. No one. He is. Yes. Amen. Who he is. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I could spend the next 20 hours easily talking about all of the attributes of God out of my finite man, mind. And if God came down here himself, and if he decided that he would humor us and begin to list off all of his attributes, there would probably not be enough time, enough space, enough paper, enough recording devices, enough of anything to capture all that God is. Oh my God. Oh my God. But, thank the Lord. That despite of his despite his great immensity, despite how great he is, he still gives us the opportunity to learn about him, to learn who he is, to glean an understanding of who he is from his work. Amen. Now I want to lead you through a little exercise of how we go through that process of understanding God and his attributes by using a very common verse. Now, remember John 3, 16? Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you go on to verse 17, sorry, it says, for God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him he might, be, might saved. be saved. Now, everyone knows that verse. But let's go through it and try to glean from it the attributes of God expressed in these two verses. For God so loved. God loves. He loved the world that he gave. That means God gives. His only begotten son. That means God owns. He has possessions. His son. That whosoever. That means God is speaking to people. He's speaking to everyone. He's speaking to anyone. That whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, should not perish. Not perish. That means God defends. He delivers. He yeah. rescues. Yeah. Should he not perish but have everlasting yes. yes. life. Yes. That means God promises. He's promised and his promises are true. Yes. Faithful and true. Yes. In verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Wait a minute. If God is condemning the world, that means God must be an authority. He is a ruler. He is Lord. He yes, is in God. charge. Yes. Yes. For yes. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through yes. him yes. might yes. be yes. saved. Yes. God purposes yes. 
Amen. that we have the opportunity to be, to be saved. Be saved. Amen. Amen. Now, there's a few more things I would say about his attributes in that, you know, God is all-seeing. That yes. was mentioned uh, last week, if it was. All-seeing, present everywhere, all-powerful, yeah. omniscient, omnipresent, yeah. omnipotent. Yeah. God is also personal. He is relational. Yeah. He is interested in you. He's interested in me. Yeah. He's interested in all of us. <laughs> so that's some of the characteristics of our God. Amen. Now, the interesting thing about the characteristics of God when it comes to us is that he used, excuse me, he used his own essence, meaning um, his own template, his, his own framework, model, um, design to shape us. Yeah. Yeah. Because in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and yeah. 27, God said, let us make man, man humankind, in our own image, yeah. according to our likeness. Yeah. So God created man, humankind, man, woman, children, so on, in his image. Yeah. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, yeah. he created them. So because God has created us in his image, that means that we have similar attributes yes. to God. Amen. We are personal. We have personalities. Yes. We have personhood. We are relational. Amen. That means we can be in relationship with one another. We yes. can be in relationship to uh, our environment, to those things around us, and we can be in relationship to our God. God is interested in you and me and us and and because we are made in his image, that means we can be interested in him as well. Amen. He desires for there to be reciprocal connection yes. to him. As he reaches out to us, we reach out to him. Amen. So he used his template to design us. He shaped us in ways that we have similar echoes of Similarities, personality, relational, interests, and so on. We have a way to know things. We have a way to be present in different situations. We have the ability to uh, have dominion and express power like he does in a very small, minute, uh, smaller scale than he does, because we're not God. But we, we express all of these things, and in Gleaning this knowledge and gleaning these similarities and gleaning these parallels, it is the hope and desire that we would be able to uh, use those characteristics to move closer to him, move closer to an understanding of who he is and why he desires to be with us. Now, I had a note here on the side that uh, I wouldn't be able to talk about all the scriptures that I would have mm -hmm. reviewed in order to begin to build this thing together. And I want to encourage you that at your own time, at your own leisure, you review the books of Genesis chapters 1 to 4, Hebrews chapters 11 and 12, Romans chapters 5, 7 and 8, 1 John chapter 3, and Jude, the entire book, on your own and review some of these things at a later time, okay? Amen. Now, <clears throat> today, in the moments that we have left, I want to be drawing your attention to the first part of the book of Genesis, which was written by Moses, Genesis being the first book of the Pentateuch, which talks about the origins of creation, origins of humankind, God's interest in humanity, uh, our adversary, the evil one, more of that later, uh, the fall of humanity through Adam and Eve, uh, the rescuing of humanity, the promise that God extends with regards to his son, calling of Abraham, Sarah, and the birth of the nation of Israel, and so on. 
the book of beginnings is Genesis. But specifically, I want to draw your attention to Genesis chapter 2, starting at uh, verse 15. And as we walk through these passages, I'd like for you to watch as God's attributes are displayed. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And uh, in my text, uh, I had a note here as well. I know that Liberty uses the uh, King James Version, which I grew up on. I've used that quite a bit. Uh, today I'm leaning on uh, the New Revised Standard Version. And I'm reading the verses here, but it's very similar to what you have in your Bible. And you should be able to follow it. It's more about the, the story that's being laid in, in my uh, text today. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. And if you have the King James Version, it has a neat way of saying this. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Let's continue. Then the Lord God said, it is not good, verse 18, that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. I hope you, you're gleaming some of these attributes here because it, it's already on display. God commands. Uh, God uh, 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 acts. He does something good for man. He, he deserves and recognizes that man should not be alone. And then he acts by making him a partner. Verse 19. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Yes. Verse 20, the man gave name to all the cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. Excuse me. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. God recognizes that even though all of these things have been created, None of them were right for the man creation that he had. So in verse 21, the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And as the man slept, now Adam has no idea what's going to happen. He's sleeping. God executes his plan, his intentions. Then he, God, took one of his, Adam's ribs, and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. Woman. Amen. Whoa, man. Whoa. <laughs> and brought her to the man. Adam may not have known God's plan, but he recognizes its effectiveness as he expresses in verse 23. Then the man said, This at last! is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. In verse 24, God establishes his divine order for marriage. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they too become one, one flesh. And a little cut of it, you know, Moses just kind of throws it at the end. Verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. 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 They were comforted with the glory of God. <laughs> comforted with the glory of God. Yes. Let's move on. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Now, a lot has happened since... Mm -hmm. the previous section that I shared with you with regards to Adam and Eve. And again, I, I'm not going to have time to go through all of that. I mean, I'm hoping that you will do that on your own. But as we move to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, it says here that they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God 
walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. God walks. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But, I love that word, they hid themselves, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? God seeks out Adam and Eve. He is calling out to them, asking where they are. What a penetrating question. You know, questions gain their value through the answers that they eventually bring forth. I wish our forefather and our foremother had brought forth better answers. But what could they do? The condition that they were in was so dire. When God asked, where are you? Listen to Adam's response. Adam said, and maybe I should use the voice with this. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I, I was afraid because I was naked, and I, I hid myself. Yes. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? I don't again. The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I, I ate it. I ate it. I ate it. <laughs> then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said. The woman said. <laughs> And, 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 you know, the, let me tell you what she said first, and then I'll add my comment after. The woman said, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. Now, the woman gives a more truthful response than the man. As a matter of fact, the woman gives a more responsible response than the man does in this situation because it was right the serpent did trick her yes the serpent twisted the words mm -hmm. and she did eat but she didn't fully embrace the fact that she was responsible and that she had disobeyed the commandment that god had given to her and you know hers was bad but Adam's was even worse because Adam was the one who was placed in charge. He yes. was the one who was given the original command. Amen. God didn't go and ask Eve first. No. God asked Adam first. Yes. When God asked Adam, Adam was the one who was responsible to answer. Yes. yes. And when he gave his answer, Adam failed to take responsibility. Yes. And that was the, the greater weight from the of the problem in this whole little scenario to here. Take responsibility. Well, God had already looked at man and asked man what was going on. And God turned to the woman and asked her what was going on. And she gave her answer. Does God turn to Satan? No. <laughs> Did God turn to the serpent and said, okay, I don't understand. Please explain to me. I gave these people this command, and you came in here and you told them something different. Please. No. God does not do that. God does not give Satan the opportunity to speak. He does not give Satan the opportunity to provide any input because God is not interested in what Satan has to say. He's not interested. It doesn't matter what the evil one has to say. And if Adam and Eve had done that in the very beginning, imagine the position that they would be in right now. They paid heed to the one who they should not have listened to yes. at all. Yes. At all. Yes. Not at all. Yes. 
Amen. Are God and Satan equals? No. No, no way. You know, like, Not even one equal. side of the coin is good, one side is evil, one side of the coin is holy, one side is unholy, one side of the coin is God. No, 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 man. no. no. No, they're not equals. Don't get it confused. God is divine, eternal, holy, righteous, outside the bounds of time. There's no limitation to him. When he speaks, everything moves. He spoke, everything came into being. Satan is not like that. Satan doesn't have divine power. He doesn't have divine authority. When Satan speaks, God listens? No. No. God doesn't have to pay attention to Satan. He doesn't listen to him. And that's why when the next phase of what takes place, there's no input from the evil one. There's only judgment. God says, the Lord God says, because you, Satan, serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. Yes. Among all animals and among all law creatures, yes. upon your belly you yes. shall go, and yes. dust you shall eat yes. all the days of your life. Yes. The enemy has a very distinct destiny, and he can't change it. There is nothing that he is going to be able to do to change his fate. Yes, I have this little thing that I, I dream about every once in a while, you know, in my imagination, that when we get to heaven, and when we are all gathered together, and God has already dealt with the antichrist and he's already dealt with the false prophet and you know dealt with the smaller minions and it comes time to deal with satan god is just going to turn to one of his angels not because they probably discussed this before and then that angel is going to grab <laughs> our enemy by his neck <laughs> and he's going to slam him to the ground <laughs> and then he's going to look at all of us smile and nod while he places his foot on yeah, Satan's yeah. neck yeah. Come on, yeah. the one who's caused such trouble and turmoil yeah. The angel will hold him down in the ground <laughs> so we can enjoy that moment <laughs> and celebrate with our God. I don't even know if God will even be really paying attention because, you know, he's God. So what? Okay, he's caused a lot of trouble. Michael, you take care of him. On the neck, door opens. Michael picks him up, casts him down. Door closes. Done. Oh. <laughs> I like that. At least for a little while, right? <laughs> Done. So, you know, you you may be paying a lot of time, uh, time and attention to the fallen one, the adversary, and I know he causes a lot of pain yeah. and trouble and all that stuff, but please understand, he, his, his time is limited. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. And he's going to pay the ultimate price, and I know that we are going to get to see it, and I'm going to enjoy that day. Anyways, moving on. So God punishes the woman, pronounces her judgment. God punishes the man, pronounces his judgment. And you can speak to any man today, or and, and they would tell you that, you know, life today is not easy. We have to live by the sweat of our brow. I've been up here all doing this all day, and that is... The result of the fall, that is our fate. We have to sweat yes. to live. And, and, and as far as a woman's uh, punishment is concerned, you can speak to any mother, wherever she is, at any time in her life, and ask her, mm, are the pangs of motherhood, uh, childbearing, do they still exist today? And I'm certain they will tell you, yes, it hasn't gone away. The curse is still running in, in full effect. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So the punishment is meted out, but thanks be to God that he does not leave it there. Because there's a little comment that he makes in Genesis 3, verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between the serpent, between Satan and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And he, Christ, will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, Satan will do his best. He's tried his best, but he has not been able to conquer our Lord. And a matter of fact, what Satan thought he was doing yeah. turned out to be the pivotal downfall of him. Yeah. He crucified our God, but by crucifying Christ, yeah. that gave Christ yeah. the opportunity yeah. to be what? Resurrected. Yeah. And because he is resurrected, yeah. we can all live. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We have the ability yeah. to be free. Whoa. Verse 22, the Lord God said, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out of his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. forever. Can you imagine what that would have been like? You know, Adam and Eve had full reign of the garden. They could go anywhere they want. They can do anything they wanted to do in the garden. They can operate with any animal they wanted to. Yeah. Play with the tigers. Play with the lions. Yeah, you know? Play with the scorpions if they wanted to. Yeah. You know, whatever they wanted to do, they could do. They could eat from any fruit they wanted to eat from. Mangoes and pears and yeah. apples. And... What would have happened if after they'd eaten the forbidden fruit, they turned around and ate from the tree of life. Mm. What would our fate have been? Mm. Oh, boy. We would be eternally bound yes. in that broken state, in that fallen state, in that separated state. And you know what happens to people who are eternally bound in that broken state, fallen state, separated state for eternity? You know who we're describing? We're describing people who are in the place where we don't want to be. No, no. We, were, we would have been eternally set yes. for the condition of hell. Yeah. And God knew that. God knew that he had to prevent humanity from getting a hold of the eternal, the, the, the tree of life and being locked into that place eternally. He discerned the danger. And so in discerning the danger, he set up the boundary, took us out of the garden, put the cherubim out in front with the sword, prevented us from going in there, keeping us in a separated place for a time where we didn't want to be, but allowing there to be a mechanism and means by which we could work our way back to the garden, work our way back to eternity. Yes. You know, when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, it wasn't a fun time for them. Uh, I think they came into a true understanding yes. of the depth of their loss. In the yes. They understood the, the grips of despair and sadness and brokenness. Yes. But even in the midst of that broken state, God was still executing his plan. His design mm -hmm. was still in motion. In Remember, that. God didn't want man to be alone. Yes. God wanted man to be in relationship. Yes. He provided for him a wife so that they could be together. And that he didn't just limit it to just a wife. God allowed man and woman, husband and wife, he allowed them to become parents. Yes. Because in chapter 4, Adam knows Eve, and Eve conceives a son, and his name is called Cain. And later on, she conceives another child, and his name is Abel. Abel. 
the family, the birth of humanity begins. And later on in, in, in uh, verse 3, it says, in the course of time, so after a lot of time has passed, Cain and Abel have grown up, and so on, an event happens where Cain brings an offering to the Lord, an offering of fruit from the ground, and presents it to God. And then Abel brings another offering, his own, to the Lord, the firstlings of his flock, with their fat, and the Lord makes a decision. He says, I have regard for Abel's offering, yes. but I don't have regard for Cain's offering. Yes. So he accepts Abel's offering, but doesn't accept Cain's offering. Right. And as a result of that event, Cain, Cain's countenance shifts. Yes. And the Lord perceives this. He says, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen, changed? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is lurking at the door. Sin's desire is to have you. But you, 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 you must master it. You must overcome it. You must wrestle it down. You must defeat it. <laughs> you must defeat it. Now, Cain doesn't respond with the intent of defeating it. Because in verse 8, Cain calls his brother Abel. And in the pretense of being friendly, he says, let's go out to the fields. And when they're both in the fields, Cain rises up against Abel and kills him. Mm -hmm. Murder. Murder. And this goes to show us that the, the stain of sin, yes. the presence of sin is not only present in the original actors, Adam and Eve, but it has leaked through to their offspring, it's leaked through to Cain, and Cain goes further in his commitment of sin than they did. Because when the Lord confronts Cain and asks Cain, Where, where's your brother Abel? Where's, where's Abel? Look at Cain's response. He lies. I do not know. I, I, I don't remember Abraham lying. And when we looked at Eve's response, I, I don't remember Eve lying. And chances are, Adam and Eve would have told the story of how they got kicked out of the garden to their children, Abel and Cain, they would have fully understand the history, and yet when Cain is confronted, Cain makes the great leap and says, I do not know. And even worse says, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> am I responsible for my brother? God is having none of this. He says, what have you done? He fast forward. What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Have you ever heard blood speak? God has. God can. When evil acts are done, you think they're done in a vacuum. But God hears, yes. senses, yes. knows, Hallelujah. sees. Yes. He's present. He's with you. He Amen. walks with yes. you. Yes. You proclaim the blood of Christ, but Christ's blood, his presence is with you. Yes. When you step into the fallen place, God is with you in that fallen place. Yes. Yes. Amen. Come on. God says, my, your brother's blood is crying out to me 
on the ground. So I know what's been going on. I know the truth. You can't lie to me. And God simply says, and now you're cursed yep. from the ground, which is open its mouth to receive your brother's blood from, from, from your hands. Your hands. And listen, when you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You remember what Cain's occupation was? Yes. Abel was taking care of sheep and livestock, but Cain, Cain was a farmer. He tilled the ground. So when God said he was cursed, he wouldn't be able to till the ground anymore. Destiny turned upside down. The promise, because listen, Cain was probably very successful as a farmer. He was able to bring something to God in order to sacrifice it. So he had some excess, success story. Mm -hmm. But in this, in the, in the aftermath of this event, he would no longer be able to do that. He'd have to find a new occupation, find something else that needs to be done. And Cain's response, Cain says... My punishment is greater than I can bear. Is that what you're waiting for? You're waiting for the punishment to be greater than you can bear? You want to be in the state where, where the destiny and promises God has laid out for you, they are gone, cast away? And you have to find something else, something new. That's not what God wants for you. God never wanted Cain to be in a fallen and separated place. He wanted Cain to be able to walk with him, be with him, celebrate with him and his brother in community. God still extends mercy. He marks Cain so that no one will kill him. And and eventually Cain finds a new occupation, but at the end of it, Cain, in verse 16, leaves the presence of the Lord. He leaves the presence of the Lord. This is not a nice message. Because really, that is what is at risk. Being separated from the presence of our Lord. When, when we talked earlier about all the attributes and all the characteristics of him, we understand all those attributes, we understand those characteristics and so on because we are in his presence. Yes. We are in relationship with him. Amen. We are able to talk with him, hear him, understand him him, see what he does, experience what he does, all of that in relationship in his presence. Yes. But when we are out of his presence, then no opportunity no. for understanding his character, no opportunity for understanding his, understanding his, uh, his characteristics, attributes, and so on, just separation. Yes. I... Uh, I am not happy to talk about this. I prefer to talk about blessings and <laughs> breakthroughs and you know uh, great victories and you know David throws a stone and Goliath gets dropped and victory. <laughs> but listen, that's only one dimension of the church's message. Yes. We as a church need to proclaim the other message to a world that is fallen dying. and dying yes. and broken yes. and on the path to separation from God forever. Yes, sir. Forever. Yes. We don't want you to be separated forever. No. I don't want you to be separated for uh, eternity. But the path of sin, the path of sin leads to death. Yes. The path of sin leads to eternal separation. Yes. But there's another path. 
Sin leads to death, leads to separation. But the path of Christ leads to hope. It leads to life. Yeah, it leads to thing. eternal con connection with God our Father. Yeah. And that is the path I'm presenting to you today. Choose that path. There's one other thing I will say before I, I, I wrap up here. You know, in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses' time is coming to an end. And he knows that he's not going to be traveling with Israel into the promised land. God has already dictated that. Um, but he, he, he brings them together to challenge them. He lays out their history. He lays out all that they've experienced. And then he culminates it into one challenge, one statement. See, before you is set life and death. Choose life. Choose life. And that's the message that I want to project to you today. You have felt the experience and brokenness of sin. You've lived that life. You know what that life has for you. You know it has no promise. Yeah, you know it doesn't have a good end. Mm -hmm. But there's a different path. Don't choose death. Life. Choose life. life. Abel died, but his blood lived. Lived to speak. And Abel still speaks today, as is, st as is stated in Hebrews. Yeah. Because Abel chose life. Yeah. He was able to choose righteousness. Yeah. He was able to choose following God. And he didn't even have Messiah. You have Messiah now. Amen. You have Christ. You have the message of Christ. Christ lived. He spoke. He died and rose again. You know him. Yeah. You see him. You even have the video of The Chosen. You get to watch that whenever you want. <laughs> so, what's it going to be? What are you going to choose? Because your time to choose may not be as long as you think it is. The time for choice may be much less than you think it is. So please, heed my words. Amen. Just bow your heads with me, please. Father, I want to thank you so much for speaking today, for helping me to share today. I thank you for the words that you've allowed to flow forward. And know that it is going on and doing your intent and your purpose today. And I pray, Father, that you will uh, recognize the ones who need to hear your word today. And I pray that you would continue to work on their hearts, continue to work on the souls. Help them to recognize their state and help them to recognize their need for you. God, you have a promised destiny for them. You desire for them to know you, know all about you, your character, your whole being. It's laying there for them, Father. But Lord, I pray that you will help them to make that choice, to choose you, to follow you. If they haven't done it before, let them make the choice today. If they've made the choice before and fallen off, Lord, I pray that you would send them back on the right path again, Lord. Revitalize their life and help them to be realigned with you. This is my prayer to you in Jesus' name. And if you are in the, if you are able to hear my voice and my message is spoken to you and you hear the Lord calling you, be sure to answer and be sure to follow him. And just say a simple prayer just like this. Lord, I recognize that I'm separated from you. And I don't want to be separated anymore. Forgive me, Lord, of my sins. 
Wash me and make me whole again, Lord, and help me to be in line with you. I accept your son, Jesus. I accept your command, and I follow you today in Jesus' name. Just say a prayer just like that, and then tell somebody about what you've done and follow him.
We praise you, Lord, and we glorify you for your word. We thank you for your land servant and a great prayer. We thank you for word of wisdom, word of knowledge. We thank you, Lord, for the impartation. We praise you and we honor you for it, mighty God. And Father, we want to thank you for our tithes and our offerings and all the other seeds that have been sown into this ministry for the furtherance of your work. We pray a thousand fold. We pray a hundred fold. We pray, God, that you bless every hand that stretch forth. We pray, God, that there will be no lacking, no shortening. We pray, God, that there will be a bountiful harvest. I speak increase. And we declare it, mighty God, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the overflow now. And we give you praise in your name, the name of Jesus, Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen. Just lift your right hand for the blessing. As I do on behalf of our pastor, the priest. The Moses, the leader of this great house. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. The Lord be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen and amen. Be blessed of the Lord. Have your son a blessed week until we meet again. God bless you. Live with your deliverance and